Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Let us uh, start today on constant optimization. You know in the last lecture we stopped while making a progress from Newton to quasi Newton methods. We stopped telling that this uh, issue of quasi Newton method cannot be understood better, cannot be understood nicely if we do not have a good knowledge about constant optimization, especially the Karush Kuntakar conditions. It is very important to know the analysis of Karush Kuntakar conditions or analysis of constant nonlinear optimization had actually begun much before these uh, methods had uh, like this quasi Newton method had been developed. So, in 1951 people knew about what are the necessary and sufficient optimality conditions for a nonlinear programming problem while 1970s and late 60s these developments have taken place the quasi Newton methods. So, <coughs> I would uh, just give a brief idea of why we want to do the quasi Newton method and why we need and when where we need the use of constant optimization. So, a Newton iteration the Newton scheme The Newton scheme is to uh, write the k plus 1 th iterate in terms of the k th iterate as now the important part is I either see I do not really know whether my Hessian matrix at every point is the iterates that I will get is positive definite. So, for a general problem the positive definiteness of the Hessian is not known. So, if it is a strongly convex problem there is no problem at all. So, for a strongly convex problem there is no problem for using Newton's method you should use Newton's method if the Hessian can be simply computed. Otherwise the problem is that you um, may if you have a general problem you may end up with an x k where the Hessian matrix is not positive definite and then you are uh, you lose that uh, descent direction. So, this may no longer be this whole thing may no longer be the descent direction. Now, how do I uh, get about go about solving this problem. So, let me think for a while that I want to whatever be my Hessian matrix I want to replace the Hessian matrix by some other positive definite matrix B k. So, what I am making at this moment is that I am trying to have B k as some sort of approximation to where B k itself is a P D matrix or positive definite matrix. So, I am trying to make this sort of approach.
Now, if this is the case, <coughs> then what I have to do is the following that okay, you want to do this, you want to have a PD matrix which is an approximate of this. So, I can now write this whole thing the equation as b k d k is equal to minus grad f x k. That is that is what it turns around turns out to be. Now, when I have b k and I have d k everything I have got a b k. Now, when I have to go from x k plus 1 to x k plus 2. So, I need the next approximation which is b k plus 1. So, the question is how will I get b k plus 1 that that is a major question. Here in order to do so people have said ok, uh, I will not make a major change in the matrix b k. So, the difference between b k and b k plus 1 should be same means uh, the distance between the, the, the b and the b k plus 1 and b k they might should not have a huge difference between them. And, and uh, and to do it in such a way so that it maintains the positive definite. So, I want that new b k plus 1 would also satisfy a similar type of condition. So, if I fix some, so if these are fixed. So, basically what I want is to find a b where I want to minimize its Frobenius norm may be square subject to Frobenius norm is same as the uh, I will tell you what the norm is. Uh, is a made norm of matrices because it is a space of matrices and subject to say b of a is equal to small b a and b are fixed basically d can minus grad f x k and also you have to have this additional constraint b transpose equal to b that is it is symmetric. So, you want to have a matrix which satisfies this and that is the so, that is the new matrix that you will get and you will be able to represent B in terms of A and B. So, once you know your grad f x k and d k you can find the new matrix B k plus 1 which will be given in terms of this because we want a matrix which is not very different from B k the B k plus 1. So, we want basically to minimize the difference between B k and B k plus 1 I am just I am not you taking taking that I am taking that matrix out for the moment and we essentially the model of the problem that we have to solve is a problem like this to find b k plus 1 that is called the principle of least change. So, here you see the Frobenius norm sorry b square f is the trace of sorry do I have a duster here ok. The trace of the matrix B B B into B B square B square B into B. So, this is the meaning of this. Now, uh, You see this is so this problem is a constraint optimization problem. So, if we do not, so this is one of the type of uh, updating that you want to do there are some others also <coughs> we will come to them later on as a example of application of constraint optimization ideas. So, this is a constraint problem. So, if we do not have ideas about constant optimization itself we cannot really make any progress in our understanding of uh, quasi Newton method basically we can 
just mug up certain rules of updating, but that does not give you the true feeling of what is really happening. So, when you learn a subject, a mathematical subject it is very important to know what the hell is actually going on. So, let us come to the story of constraint optimization. Let me tell you the story of optimization has a very checkered history. Optimization is a very ancient subject, it is not a subject that has just evolved in some 20 years or 30 years or 40 years or even 50 years. It is a subject which at least date, dates back to more than 300 years or so, 300 years when it started as really been pursued as a mathematical subject. Now, I want to uh, stress on the following fact. Okay, where do I write? Maybe I will write it here. That one of the basic facts that you know that if you have a function from R to R, which is a differentiable function, then if you want to find an x star a minimizer of this function, of course, then you have to first attempt to find an x star which is equal to 0, f dash x star is equal to 0. This is what you have to first do. Of course, any x star which satisfies this need not be a minima, but if x star is already known to be a minima, it must satisfy this. So, this is a necessary condition and in optimization one of the major things is the study of necessary conditions, because it tells you how to compute at least a point which you can start suspecting of being your minimum or maximum whatever you want to do. So, here so if so if x star is a mean mean or local minimizer or whatever I am just writing very loosely. So, this idea was known to Pharma, but for, uh, during Pharma's time, Pharma of the famous Pharma's last theorem, uh, during Pharma's time you really did not have any idea about uh, derivatives. It was uh, done slightly later by Newton and Leibniz and developed by other people like Euler and the Bernoullis. What he proved was the following, He's, uh, what he tried to demonstrate that if you have a polynomial equation, of course, in those days most functions algebraic functions were taken as polynomials. So, polynomial if you have a polynomial equation and then uh, if you have a polynomial function and then you want to minimize it, then at the point of minima or maxima the front here and here that is wherever there is a hill, there is a hill top and wherever there is a valley, the tangent at those points would actually become parallel to the x axis. That is what Pharma showed and this is that is why this result is local minima global minima I have not written this result is known as Pharma's rule. But however, the story of constant optimization began 300 years ago with a very interesting problem called the Brachystrophone problem. Let us see what is that problem. I hope my spelling is right. So, what is the it was a problem posed by John Bernoulli. So, the problem is as follows it says that uh, I have taken a wire some wire like this I do not know some wire uh, copper wire and I have put a bead here and I allow this bead to fall freely under its own weight that is fall under freely under gravity. I just put the bit there and just leave it. So, it starts travelling. Now, this point my starting point A and my ending point B is fixed because that is the end points of the wire. Now, this starts travelling and slipping down. Now, the question is, so this is a copper wire if you have forgotten 
and this is a bead and that bead is now running down this wire. The question of course is what should be the shape of the wire so that this bead will take minimum time to come from A to B. A natural instinct is to say it will be just hold that make this copper hold this copper wire straight make the make them into a straight line that is hold the copper wire like this from A to B. Because you say okay, the straight line is the shortest distance, but of course who told you it is the shortest distance. Of course you can say okay from geometry you know that the shortest distance between two points and so on the shortest distance it will have the shortest path because the gravity will act possibly in a similar way that you might it might appear to you. But the answer to this problem is no along the straight wire it does not take the least time it le the least time is taken in somewhere of this shape which is called a cycloid. This problem gave rise to what is called the calculus of variations. So, in calculus of variations, you are expected to find okay, uh, here. So, what am I supposed to do here? If I look at it like this, this problem A to B, then So, basically this is my x axis, this is my y axis, I am looking at the point on the y axis. And uh, so, I have to, so I have to find the time of a particle running down this. So, it will be the distance by the velocity. So, this is x and this is y. So, y is a function of x. So, y dash x is the velocity right and I basically I have to find the curve y. y is the curve that I have to find. So, basically my length is root over 1 plus d y d x whole square. So, basically it is y dash x whole square divided by the velocity which is y dash x. So, if I this because this is the length of d s uh, uh, elemental arc here d s and this is d s by the instantaneous velocity at x which is y dash x. So, this so if you integrate it over the whole wire from a to b this is what you get. So, x is equal to so from here if you come so, so here it is something say x is equal to <clears throat> maybe I should write this as my corresponding b point a is this point. So, if this is say a is a when a is my 0 point and the corresponding point here is say some x naught. So, basically I have to now integrate from 0 to x naught. But I have to remember that my y of x naught y of 0 has to be 0 at the same time my y of x naught has to be b this is b this distance. So, this end points are fixed and now I have to find a y. So, this is actually a function of y I need to find a y which will give me this which will which will satisfy this as well as minimize this integral. 
So, basically I have to minimize this integral the distance uh, sorry uh, the time taken by the bead and it has to also satisfy these two so called end point conditions, but these end point conditions are actually constraints on the problem. These end point conditions are actually constraints on the problem and hence what you get is not a standard problem of minimizing f over r n, you get a very mathematically involved and exciting problem, because here you have constraints and here you really have to fun find a function y, a function. So, of course, there is a question of what sort of function, whether it is differentiable, how many times differentiable, how, how, how is its continuity, what are its continuity properties etcetera. So, in of course, in those days nobody bothered about those continuity properties or differentiability properties of y, they just said okay, obviously it has to be differentiable naturally. Uh, they took as good functions as they wanted nice very nice functions for which for every nice good things happen. So, of course, now we in a in modern days this calculus of variation though 300 years old this was this problem was possibly given in the 16, uh, 50, 16, 50, 16 I am forgetting somewhere uh, somewhere in the 1650s I guess if I am not mistaken. So, so it is 300, 300 plus 300 more than 300 years old problem, but this more than 300 years old problem is still continuing to give us new insights and has lot of new things and lot of new applications. Calculus of variations is still a growing subject is a very important area of research in optimization. Now, this y from a modern point of view has to be chosen from a function space, because it is a function and it resides in a function space. Those who have any idea about the subject of function analysis would know that this function spaces are not finite dimensionals like or r 3 or r 2. So, this function spaces one has to understand are infinite dimensional. So, in effect this is an infinite dimensional optimization problem with this sort of constraints. So, what you have got here is a constraint optimization problem. So, the initial problem of the calc the, this back stroke on problem gives you a very interesting constraint optimization problem. And in order to solve this problem not only that the subject of calculus of variations are developed this term variations is due to the, the technique that was developed by Lagrange, but it is important to note that this uh, problem has given rise to lot of new mathematics in order to solve, solve the major issues here. It is not a very trivial thing by the way, it is not so easy to just do things here, but it is one of the most exciting areas of uh, mathematics and possibly I will do a little bit of very very basic things about it once we have some time we at the end. Maybe it is a good idea to bring in some of calculus of variations, but we will keep on our finite dimensional approach and do it. So, that is not a very big issue. Now, what is uh, important is that I would like to also show you the book that I had been mentioning which I will follow while st uh, studying the uh, Karush Kuntagar condition or necessary optimality condition is called foundations of optimization by Osman Guler is a publication by Springer and it is in the series the graduate text in mathematics. I think those who are uh, doing some advanced work in optimization like their PhDs or even very young researchers should have this uh, book with them. Okay. Now, this problem also has another story the calculus of variations was that uh, which is actually a part of calculus of variations, but uh, there is another uh, old uh, ancient problem that has been given that princess Dido fleeing from the persecution of her brother came to a land which is now uh, Carthage, the city of Carthage uh, and he asked the local uh, leader there Yaqub uh, that she needs some land. So, Yaqub asked how much you need, she said cut a bull's hide that skin of a dead bull and make thin pieces and just sew up the pieces, stitch up the pieces and then see how much 
area you can enclose. So, the problem is as follows given a curve a closed curve of a fixed length what is the curve which will enclose the maximum area that is suppose I have two curves this, this is so I have taken a taken a thread like this and this thread I can put it like this the same thread I can put it like that this the same thread. So, their length, lengths are same perimeter is same. Now, the question is which one of them will enclose the maximum area the answer is surprisingly simple and that is the view that is where the beauty of mathematics lies the answer is the circle. So, there Dido uh, took that land and established the modern city of the current city of Carthage which is there and this problem is called the isoperimetric problem. that is the perimeter is same, but the one which would in enclose the maximum area. Now, largely optimization problems were relegated to this to physical sciences, natural sciences and the constraints which appeared, appeared in the form of equalities. come back 250 years more when we are in the or 300 years and we are in the 9th in the 20th century where during the second world war and later on it was realized that there are lot of issues in optimization a lot of issues in business engineering economics specially uh, where you cannot just have equality constraints you have to impose inequality constraints. Let me give you a simple example which comes from economics which tells us how inequalities has become the hallmark of modern optimization. And now the Lagrange multiplier rule which Lagrange had taught to solve the calculus of variations has to be modified to generate a rule which can handle also inequality constraints. And from that is where the subject of mathematical programming or finite dimension optimization starts up. So, let us now look at uh, this problem of budget in economics budget problem. Suppose a market has n commodities. So, there is a market and this a market has n commodities. Now, if my market has n commodities, how do I represent that market? From the point of view of modern mathematical economics, we would represent the market that any commodity bundle must have n commodities and that would be an element in R n that is x is a commodity bundle. So, this has n commodities x 1 x 2 dot dot x n. So, they say first is rice, atta, dal, this, that and so on. Now, this is the quantity of rice, this is the quantity of atta, this is the quantity of so on. So, there could be infinite such possibilities of quantities you can choose. So, theoretically of course, not in real practical life, practical life is somewhat little different. So, in order to model it, so I can now say every commodity can be viewed as a vector and this vector x is called a commodity bundle. Now, how do I choose a commodity? How do I know that okay, I want the, there are two commodity bundles uh, given to me and how do I know what to choose, how to choose it, which one I require, how do I know that. Now, so there the question comes of preference. So, if I am given two commodity bundles x and y.
So, if I am given two commodity bundles x and y, how do I know whether I prefer x over y or y over x or I am indifferent, I can choose any one. So, if I choose x over y or I am possibly even indifferent, there is a symbol which is used in economics which is called the preference symbol. That is okay, I want to choose x over y, that is I prefer x over y. This thing means I prefer x over y. Now, suppose the unit price of the first quantity is P 1, unit price of the second quantity is P 2, unit price of the third quantity is P uh, n, nth quantity is P n. So, price of these quantities are given. So, this is a fixed vector in R n, price is fixed. Now, what happens is that how do I numerically decide whether I prefer the bundle x over the bundle y. This can only be done if I have some functions which will tell me that okay, whenever I want, whenever I prefer x over y that function should be such a function u say such that u x would be bigger than u y. So, these sort of functions u are called utility functions. in economics. So, what utility function does is the following, it tells you that okay, take x and y and find the values of u x and u y. If u x is bigger than u y, it would imply that I am prefer, I would, I should prefer x over y. And if I prefer x over y, I should have this. Now, in, in the strict philosophical point of view, if I am a utilitarian, uh, utilitarian in the sense that I want to maximize my own life, I want to maximize my happiness. So, what I have to do is to maximize my utility. So, I have to choose an x, choose a commodity bundle which will give me the maximum value of u. But this choice cannot be just arbitrary because I have some fixed amount of money with me that is my budget. Say I have B amount of money with me capital B. So, if I buy a commodity bundle X, my price that I will pay for it is of course, if you do not want to, if you want to go step by step, it will be P 1 X 1 plus P 2 X 2 plus P n X n. So, if I buy the commodity bundle x 1, x 2, x n, this is what I what price I should pay, but this price cannot exceed the budget I have or at least equal to the budget I have, because this I have limited amount of money. Now, which means in general I have to maximize u x subject to this constant. So, it is maximizing u x subject to p dot product x or inner product x, you those who know be very basic uh, vector calculus, you would know what just very basic linear algebra would know that this is the inner product. And so, this is what I intend to do. Of course, now you can impose conditions that x 1, x 2, x 1 has to be greater than or equal to 0. Of course, if I have x 1, x 2 negative means I just do not negative or basically 0, I do not buy it you can also put in that restriction x size has to be greater than or equal to 0. So, what you have here is actually a minimization of a function over a set of with in, in terms of a certain linear constraint, but these are inequalities. So, the inequality is very much real in modern day applications and so here how would you handle and try to solve a problem with inequality constraints and that is one of the major hallmarks. Inequalities remain to be the major hallmarks of modern optimization. So, our goal would be to first study problems with inequality constraints. You might ask why not study this? This involves lot of 
techniques from modern analysis which might not be known to all the students or all the viewers of this course. So, we would go into something which is more manageable and done through a very beautiful uh, mathematics of convexity of convex sets and functions. So, we will try to first start understanding the constant optimization problem with inequalities. Then our next step would be to add equalities to it and, and get and uh, see the Lagrange's paradigm in its all its beauty. Of course, as I said that we will go into this problem later on at a certain stage uh, when we have some time. I cannot promise it, but I will try my best to do that. You need it is very important to have some information about this kind of these problems. And anybody who wants to be an optimization theory optimizer in the future should really uh, know these problems. Now, uh, how do I go about it? What is the first question that I should ask about it? The first question that I should know about it is whether this problem has a solution. When will such a problem inequality constant problem will have a solution? So, this is a very general question when will this what kind of when will this kind of problems have a solution? It is it's not so easy to immediately tell that uh, okay, I looking at a problem whether this will have a solution or not, but it is very important to know, know when will a particular class of problems optimization problems will have a solution. So, that is one thing we will need to know. We will give a brief outline when a general optimization problem or constant optimization problem will have a solution which depend on the nature of the feasible set. So, these are the set of all these are the constraints the set of all axes which satisfies this in R n would be the feasible set associated with this for example, this utility problem. Now, the important question that lies ahead is that okay, if I possibly know that this problem has a solution how do I go about and find it. So, there must be some way to first get a point which I can start suspecting as my minimum. So, this is the question of asking what are the conditions which are necessarily followed by a local minimizer or a global minimizer. So, if I have a local minimizer that the local minimizer must satisfy this condition and hence if I find a x star which satisfies those condition then I can start suspecting that that might be the my chosen my oh, my local minimizer. So, the first step is to know after learning a bit about the existence of solutions what are the local uh, what are the necessary conditions for optimality of the existence of a local minimizer that is if extra is a local minimizer of a constant optimization problem under inequalities only for the time being what are what are the necessary conditions for optimality and how they are helpful to us. So, we will stop with this and we will take it up from the next lecture.